Up next is PJ Bevan, a zookeeper for the last 15 years. She will present slides in the middle of the screen about magical animals from our world and what we can do to protect them. Hello and welcome Geek Girl Conline 2020. I am PJ Bevan and this is Fantastic Beasts and how to save them. Have you ever dreamed of seeing or meeting your favorite magical creature? Well, I have a secret for you. They do exist. They've been hiding in plain sight right in front of our eyes. And today I'm going to lift the veil, I'll unleash the magic, and introduce you to some of your favorite fantastic beasts and magical creatures. And we're gonna to connect to them in a very positive way. We're also gonna learn how we can keep them around for future generations of witches and wizards to come. So without any further delay, let's jump right in to Fantastic Beasts and learn how to save them. Now, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I was a magic zoologist for 15 years working with some of the most magical creatures on the planet. From owls to mermaids disguised as manatees, I've worked with some amazing, amazing creatures, like the moon calves disguised as tapers, to even oliphants, or, well, okay, that's a completely different fandom. I had a great time learning from all these animals, have, seeing the magic that each creature has within themselves. I'm going to share with you a little bit of my experience working with many of these animals and learning about them, again, growing an appreciation hopefully opening our eyes to the wild and wonderful world that is right outside our door. So this is how the, I believe that the disguising charms work. They have, our magical creatures have a, a hidden life and they are giving a charm so that we can hide in plain sight among muggles and not be detected, the, keeping the, the statute of secrecy in place, even while magical creatures have, who have no understanding of the statute of secrecy are roaming around right alongside muggles. So I believe this would probably work very similarly to a Fidelius charm where only very trained magizoologists are going to be able to see this, uh, these magical creatures for what they really, really are. So, so even if you identify as a witch or wizard, it's not a guarantee that you'll automatically be able to see the extraordinary creature that's hiding within. But this talk is basically me as a sort of secret keeper lifting the veil so we can see the animal for what they really are. Now a lot of these animals uh, are pretty obvious how they got their counterpart. It's almost exact matches. If you look at the augury and the, their hidden counterpart, the Philippine eagle, there's no surprise as to why Wizards chose that as their hidden form. It's almost as if they actually are the same animal. However, not all animals are going to look exactly the same. So for instance, I worked with moon calves for, uh, for four or five years at Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle. They're disguised as an animal called a taper. Um, they don't look exactly like a moon calf, but that is kind of the point, the animals are supposed to look a little different than their magical counterparts. Um, because if a unicorn looked exactly like a uni like its counterpart, there would be no protection in their disguise and muggles would still be hunting unicorns today. Some of these animals don't look anything like their non-magical or their magical counterparts, but that is exactly the point. And there might be another reason why these animals look very different too. Now in the case of people, they are classified as beings, not beasts. So they were offered the opportunity to choose their form of a disguise. Now those that don't live in protected areas like the Black Lake at Hogwarts chose to the form of something that we think was probably a bit on the ironic side, that is the manatee. Because if you're looking at, at, at first glance, the manatees and people look absolutely nothing alike. But then again, that is the point. If manatees looked exactly like people, then they would be hunted and sought after for their magical abilities. 
Now, not every single animal is going to look exactly like its magical or non-magical counterpart. However, there is a connection between each animal. That's what we're going to be discussing a little bit today as well. Now, one of the main criteria for choosing a non-magical counterpart was an animal that muggles and nomads were probably not super familiar with. Now, it worked out for the most part because it kept the disguise hidden from non-magical community. However, having non-traditional animals as, our dis as the disguise, these animals fell under the radar and now many of them are considered threatened or endangered of becoming extinct. Now, they are endangered, they are threatened, but that means that there is still hope. Extinction is forever, it means they are gone from this earth. But endangered or threatened means we do still have hope. I'm not going to say time, but we do still have hope as long as we act now. So that's what we're going to be discussing is how can we save these animals, these magical creatures that we love and adore in our, in our real life. And on that note, guys, it is geek out time. I will admit one quick note. Uh, this, this presentation took me a lot longer than I anticipated because there are just so many animals, so many magical creatures out there that we could be here all day and not even scratch the surface of how wonderful and how magical this world really is. So with that in mind, I do have a, a limited list of the animals. I picked out some of the ones I felt would be most interesting to us to learn about. If I didn't mention your favorite, first of all, I do, not, I do apologize. It's not personal. It's just that I have a lot of subject matter in front of me. But if you would like to know about what your personal favorite magical creature might be in the, in the real world, look forward to my YouTube channel where I'll be discussing these more in depth. Again, calling it Fantastic Beasts and how to save them. That is on my ZooFit YouTube page. So look forward to that. But once again, it is now geek out time. And we're going to get started with the most popular wizard's, wizard's animal of the series. All right, and we're going to kick off our journey with actually not non-magical animal, but an animal that really does symbolize, especially the wizarding world of Harry Potter. And that would be the owl. Again, I feel like you cannot have a conversation about magical creatures in the wizarding world and not talk about Owls, not even though they are not uh, magical in their in their right of they possess you know ingredients for spells or <clears throat> or abilities, they are important and very valuable to the wizarding community for male communication and and as companions. But I will emphasize that owls in the wizarding community are going to be different than the ones that we see. And we experience on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, however, when people see uh, Harry or any of the wizards that might be going through platform nine and three quarters and they see a owl in a cage, it gets implanted in their mind that maybe these animals could be good pets. Now, humans, or wizards or muggles could not care for normal owls, the ones that we can see in the wild, the way that wizards do and expect them to thrive. Wizarding owls that we are, that we may think that we're seeing or that we see in the films are going to be different. They have some kind of magical capacity. And unfortunately, again, having worked with owls, having the, the opportunity to get these really cool pictures, it does give an impression that these animals could make, could make good pets. Uh, let me be clear though, owls, as with most wild animals, magical or not, do not make good pets. They have very specific needs. They eat animals, so they're not going to eat kibble. They do need space to fly. They need places just to roam around. Living in a small cage is not going to cut it for them. Um, getting small little interactions are, is not going to cut it for them. So they do not make really good pets. However, when, when people, when muggles saw the Harry Potter films, the sales of pet owls rose by 130%. Uh, 
Um, this is dangerous on a couple levels. Number one, that increase in sales is not sustainable to, to the populations of captive bred owls. So there's a really high chance that these owls were coming from the wild. This is a non-sustainable practice. And so just because we see it in a film does not necessarily make it a, a good idea for us to bring them on as our pet. So the lesson is that these are magical creatures and they do have magical properties, but it's best to, to appreciate them for what they are in their natural environment. Let's leave these animals to be wild. If you really wanna view them up close and personal, there are opportunities, especially in zoos and aquariums, to see these in all their glory in a very well taken care of environment. All right, we have our first actual uh, magical creature. That would be the zoo. Uh, so the zoo, interestingly, you can't find it in any edition of Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. And there are a couple of uh, theories as to why. Some of them suggest that wizards overexploited their, them for their travel magic or just for their magic abilities in general, and that they've been placed under protection and that Newt Scamander purposefully left them out so that no one will know where to find this fantastic beast. Uh, we, we believe that they've been disguised in a place where not many uh, wizards, and be, to be frank, not many muggles are going to find them. We think that they're disguised as the snow leopard to help protect them because they, they live in one of the most remote places on Earth that's in the Himalayan mountain. Zou were once called the king of the mountains or the ghost of the Himalayas. Uh, their populations though have declined in recent years. In fact, now there's only estimated four to 6,000 left in the world. Now the Zou have many threats, including poaching and farm retaliation. And what that means is that uh, not only are the snow leopards hunted for their beautiful fur, but their prey is poached as well. So as their prey becomes scarcer and scarcer, the snow leopards find other ways of feeding themselves. And most often that's going to be in the form of livestock of cattle ranchers in the region. As you can possibly imagine, this creates a wildlife, human wildlife conflict. Farmers retaliate against snow leopards and their numbers go down. So this is a big issue. Poaching and farmer retaliation is a huge, huge issue, but climate change is becoming a huge factor as well. In addition to human encroachment on their environment in, in general, whether it's making farms, small communities, or for, uh, for further development. Now it is important that we have the Zowu in the Himalayas be a healthy part of the ecosystem. Now we can do our part here at home by reducing our carbon footprint to decrease the impact of climate change. We can also support organizations that are protecting and helping communities protect snow leopards. Now organizations like the Snow Leopard Trust Fund are helping communities where the Zowu does roam free. But the Snow Leopard Trust Fund is even more interesting because they actually use their funds that they get to help empower the women of the village. And with this uh, empowerment, the women gain prestige and are able to make better decisions to protect the snow leopards. They are the ones that are the front line of protecting this wild cat, protecting this magical creature. And they're also reaping the benefits from the, the funding that comes from the Snow Leopard Trust Fund. So the, this is a local organization to Washington. They are actually based out of Seattle. So if you have an opportunity to, to support them, you see any of their products, definitely check them out and save the Zowu. So next we have a, a, a new favorite of mine. When the Four Houses of Ilvermorny, there's a, that is the, the American school of witchcraft and wizardry. They are represented by magical creatures from North American lore. And that would be the Thunderbird, the Wampus, the Wampus Cat, the Pukwudgie and the Horned Serpent, which happens to be my house. So this is my talk. I get to pick the, <laughs> pick the animal that I want. And believe it or not, this is a really interesting animal though. The Horned Serpent uh, is the house of the scholars and those who are looking to 
improve their minds as well as, as well as the world. I believe that they want the world to be a better place, but they use their minds to do this. But what really, uh, what really got to me was their hidden form. Again, looking or what could be possibly disguising the uh, horned serpent, and it's a it's a doozy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Hellbender, or, or what is affectionately called the a Muggle Zoo community, the Snot Otter. <laughs> now, if that is not a magical creature in disguise, I don't know what is. <laughs> this would be uh, definitely a face that only Hagrid could love, or any magizoologist for that matter. These are a, a, U, a United States animal. They're found in rivers and streams throughout the East and the Midwest. And they are considered what we would call an indicator species for the ecosystem. What this basically means is you cannot have a healthy ecosystem without healthy hellbenders. These are amphibians. They thrive. They need healthy, clean water in order to, in order to survive. With their numbers declining, it makes it a little bit more troublesome for scientists to, to feel confident that the ecosystem is not is thriving as well. So again, healthy, healthy hellbenders, healthy rivers and streams. Now what, what, is, uh, what is causing the decline of hellbenders? Well, mostly it's pollution from runoff that's going into our streams. So that would be the pesticides on our, on our farm products and other toxic chemicals that we pour down our drains as well. This is th their biggest threat, uh, not just to the hellbenders themselves, but to, uh, to the rivers and stream ecosystem as well, them being the indicator species. So we can help hellbenders, we can help the horned serpent by being careful what we pour down the drain. There are many different alternatives, safe, non-toxic alternatives to bleach and to the cleaning chemicals that we use in our house every single day. And another thing is to uh, support organic local farmers. Even if they're not certified organic, if they're local farmers and they are not using pesticides on their products, support them because they're helping build a healthy ecosystem for healthy hellbenders. And again, keeping that whole, uh, the whole process good for us and good for them. All right, everybody, we've got my top 10 magical creatures right here. Number 10 is the Thestral. They became a quickly a fan favorite because they were introduced in uh, Order of the Phoenix and they've been seen in, in the Fantastic Beasts franchise. They have a really mysterious understanding. Like they can only be seen by those who have seen death. They're, they have a, a bit of a bad reputation because of this characteristic. To hide them, wizards have disguised them as a, an animal called the Mauritius flying fox, a large fruit bat. And just like their magical counterpart, the flying foxes do have an unwarranted bad reputation, being like omens of death and being troublesome animals. Now, these specific bats, these animals are frugivores, and what that means is that they eat only fruit. But they're also a keystone species, so a little bit different than indicator. What this means is that without them, the ecosystem will perish. Being fruit eaters, being frugivores, they eat a lot of the fruit, ingesting the seeds, and then what goes in must come out. They then distribute the seeds, and without them, the forest would literally perish. So the ecosystem needs flying fox. They need these bats in order to continue on to th throughout life. However, even though they are, they are very important to the ecosystem, uh, Mauritius flying foxes and, and most of their counterparts, most bats, especially fruit bats, are considered vulnerable. Now, one of, one of the issues that they are facing is deforestation, especially in other regions. But specifically, the Mauritius flying fox is, is uh, extra vulnerable because the government themselves have recently opened war on, uh, declared war on this species. Recently called thousands of flying fox in order to protect fruit farms from in invasion, basically from their wording. Now flying fox is not innocent of taking some of the crops. They are responsible for up to 11% loss of food crops. 
but that is nothing compared to what what we as humans do for food to food waste. I've heard certain statistics say that before they even get into the market because of their imperfections or because they don't meet normal standards of supermarkets, that up to 40% of the food that is harvested is thrown out. And that particularly I've heard that with bananas, but also a lot of other exotic fruits. They're not a certain size. They have too many bruises. They get completely tossed out. So this is something we can, can change a little bit by our consumer demands. What we buy matters. So when you're buying produce, reduce the food waste first and foremost. Only get what you need. And try out less than perfect foods. There are, there are actually companies now that focus on this. There's imperfect foods. There is also, there's also ugly fruits or ugly foods. You can try that or again, simply when you go to the supermarket, if it's a little bruised, go ahead and get it. it the, a lot of this food is still quite delicious. And it does send that message that even if it's not beautiful, even if it's not perfect, it's still great. It's still good for us. And it's also going to be better for the bats. And next we have the erumpents. And erumpents are one of my favorite animals. They're a large rhino-like creature with an explosive horn. It kind of <laughs> makes mating a little bit dangerous. They are originally from Africa, looking very much like the northern white rhinos, or at least that is the belief. But I think pressure from muggle hunters once they start colonizing Africa and start going on hunting safaris, I think that this kind of forced a new identity for the erumpets uh, by the wizarding community. Now, I firmly believe that erumpents are now disguised as Javan rhinos. This is a, a really good, a seemingly good setup for them because they are protected by a magizoologist in a national park called the Ujang Kulon National Park in Java, Indonesia. This is the only place on the planet you can find this species of rhino. There are only 60 or 70 left in the world, and they're all found in this one specific national park in Java, Indonesia. Now because they're in a, a national park that is manned by park rangers, they are very safe in that protected sanctuary. However, they're just, there isn't enough space for them. And that means that unless we can give them more land to grow in numbers, they could go extinct if we don't uh, take action. Now it's not going to be just a matter of giving them more land because Right now, when we give them more land, they are hunted in those regions. So it's also going to take stricter laws around poaching and wildlife tra trafficking, make sure those are enforced to help save the Java rhino and the rumpet. And we have uh, number eight is a Kelpie. Um, the Kelpies are a shape-shifting demon, basically considered very, very, very dangerous and should only be approached and worked with by highly trained magizoologists. And that is not me. <laughs> I have not been trained to work with Kelpies whatsoever. Newt Scamander is a special, special case, but there are some magizoologists and some uh, regular zoologists that have worked with their non-magical counterpart. Now what's interesting about their non-magical counterpart is that it's almost the exact opposite of what a Kelpie is. They are this very fragile, very delicate, very beautiful leafy sea dragon. Now like the Kelpie itself, it does take someone who is very trained to work with them. These animals are found in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. That Great Barrier Reef is, seems to be a haven for other magical creatures in disguise that we aren't going to necessarily discuss today, but the Shrake, uh, among several, several others, can be found in the Great Barrier Reef. Now, as you can probably imagine, a Kelpie itself does not do well in captivity, but honestly, neither do leafy sea dragons. They, they do not do well unless they are cared for by highly trained professional. So you will see sometimes, you will see leafy sea dragons in aquariums. These are again highly trained professionals. They, there has been known fact that just slight changes in the pH balance of that water can kill leafy sea dragons. So 
while they are beautiful, beautiful animals, they will not make really good pets unless you have the setups and the, and the commitment to make sure that they are given the best care. Now, pet trade has been an issue for, for leafy sea dragons, for Kelpies in the past, as well as their relatives, the seahorse. But this is, again, nothing compared to some of the threats that they are facing now. They are facing also coral bleaching from climate change. And the newest emerging issue, perhaps the most dangerous for mo many ocean-dwelling creatures, is single-use plastic waste. It's just decimating coral reefs and fish populations. One, one quick note about plastic is that it is forever. It, it, does, it does break up, meaning like they'll break into smaller pieces, but it never actually breaks down. It's not going to disappear. So what, what that means is, again, plastic bags are going to break up into smaller and smaller pieces. Plastic bottles, the same thing. It's going to break up in smaller pieces. That makes it even more dangerous. That means that even the smallest of creatures can start eating that plastic, which then gets eaten by other animals. Again, bigger pieces might get, might get eaten. And so kelpies are at risk of ingesting plastic, uh, sea turtles, uh, and other, other sea creatures as well. So what can we do to protect the kelpie? Well, reducing our dependence on plastic, uh, reducing our single-use plastic dependence, getting uh, reusable straws, reusable uh, water bottles, drink cups, and using canvas bags over plastic bags. These little, little actions can have a huge impact, not just on our lives, but on, on, the, on the ocean, and the whole entire world. So again, reducing our plastic use will be very, very beneficial for not just the Kelpie, but hundreds of magical and non-magical creatures. And now we have the Hippogriff. Hippogriffs are our fan favorite. They mainly, mainly because of Buckbeak during the Prisoner of Azkaban, a beautiful, beautiful animal. They have been described as proud and easily offended by Newt's commander and, and they do demand quite a bit of respect. Now such a, a magnificent magical creature, of course we would pick a magnificent animal to represent them in the non-magical world. And I think they did a fabulous job with the, the harpy eagle. This is the largest eagle species on the planet. And so it would be easy to think that this animal could hold its own in the muggle world. I mean, it's a really powerful animal. They can carry up to 22 pounds in their talons and, and fly. Truly, truly the king of the Amazon rainforest. But just like with many of the other animals we are, uh, we are learning about, harpy eagles are in trouble. Their big threat is deforestation. This is the clearing of the land, especially in the Amazon, not just for logging, but for cattle ranchers. In fact, that is probably the number one reason that they are clearing as much land as they are. This deforestation does put them at risk. And there is a very sim couple simple actions that we can do. Reducing our dependence on paper products, so reuse and recycle. Eating a less fast food and decreasing our beef consumption are helpful too. So even if we just decrease our meat consumption by eating one meatless day a week, it would have a huge impact not just on harpy eagles, but on the environment itself. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Reducing the need for deforestation, reducing the need for these large cow ranches and the need to, to cut down trees will help the harpy eagle uh, reign supreme in the rainforest. And one of, my, one of my favorites, they're all my favorite, but one of my favorites is the demiguys. I was very shy, reclusive animals. You may be familiar that the idea that their hair is used to make invisibility cloaks, so they're very valuable in the wizarding community. I do believe that this can be their kind of their downfall. They've probably been overhunted and then actually hidden from the wizarding world for their protection before needing protection from their muggles. And it's easy to assume when you hear a description of a demiguy's long long hair and not being told that, uh, whether it's white or red or anything. A lot of wizards assume that the non-magical disguise was an orangutan, but they were incorrect. They were close, but they were incorrect. 
So the actual animal is the one that you see up here. This is called a white-cheeked gibbon, and they are found in the same regions as orangutans, and they are distantly related. So this is what we call lesser ape. Now, because they live in the same region as orangutans, they face similar threats. The biggest for these animals is the habitat destruction from the palm oil industry. Populations have unfortunately for the for the demi guys for the white cheek gibbon has fallen 80% in the last 40 years due to the rise of the palm oil industry. This is devastating to to their populations, making them almost non-sustainable unless we do something to help them out. And it's important to note that what you buy matters. Palm oil is that ingredient I just mentioned um, that's causing the, the decline of the demi guys, and it is in absolutely everything that we buy. So it is important for us as muggles, witches, wizards, whatever you identify yourself as, whatever you are buying, to read labels and be wary. I'm not going to say never buy food or health products with palm oil in them, but be wary of those products. When you're buying items for your home, such as furniture or books, make sure that you buy products that are for Stew Stewardship Council certified. Now, demi guys do have the power to become invisible, but it would be a real tragedy to see this animal completely disappear. So let's make conscious consumer decisions so for, to help save this amazing magical ape. A, a strange animal, the Grindylo, they are incredibly aggressive and except for to mer people who keep them as pets for some reason, typically avoided by all witches and wizards. That is again, unless you are a Triwizard Champion, <laughs> a pretty aggressive animal. One of the strangest disguises in my opinion compared to their, to their very aggressive counterpart. The Vaquita porpoise is again, an exact opposite. They are found only in the Gulf of California, uh, Mexico border. They are the smallest cetacean in the world. So the cetacean is all the dolphins, whales, and porpoises. And they are also, unfortunately, the most endangered animal on the planet right now. There are literally only 10 or 12 individual vaquita porpoises left. Now their main threat is not over hunting or over fishing for vaquita porpoise themselves. It's the illegal fishing using gill nets. They get caught up and tangled. Now the outlook for the vaquita porpoise, the Grindylo, does look a bit grim. As I said before, Extinction is forever, but endangered, even with 10 to 12 individuals, means we still have hope. We can make simple choices to help save the vaquita porpoise and the grindylo. The biggest thing we can do is to make sure that the seafood that we are eating is sustainably sourced. Now, two ways you can do this is looking for the Marine Stewardship Council logo on your favorite seafood products or downloading the Seafood Watch app. This app is free for your smartphone, developed by the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and it is frequently updated with your best choices for seafood, good alternatives for seafood, and then what seafood you should avoid at all costs that are not sustainably sourced. These simple actions can have a profound impact on not just the vaquita porpoise, but other susceptible marine life making sure that we have not just healthy ocean life, but a healthy ocean. Now, nifflers are number four. And guys, these are, became fan favorites the second they hit the screen. Uh, they are masters at finding treasure. It does make them highly, highly valued in the wizarding world. And because of their popularity, they have been mistaken for dozens of uh, muggle animals, including a platypus and the echidna. But their actual hidden form is as a small animal, small mammal known as the pangolin. Now while they don't look exactly like the niffler, they do have a very unique connection. And that is, while the niffler is great at finding treasure and collecting it, the pangolin itself is considered a valuable treasure. Now if you look at the pangolin in the picture, you'll see they have hard scales that cover their entire body. This, those scales are highly prized 
and it does make the pangolin, all eight species, the most trafficked wild animal on the planet. Now, people value those scales for healing and for decoration. Those, those scales actually, as you probably imagine, contain no magical or healing properties. In fact, they're made of the very same substance as our hair and our fingernails, and that would be a, a substance called keratin. No magical properties, except for what we can see uh, shining through with them. Now, the irony is that uh, these are the most trafficked animals in the world, but many people have never even heard of a pangolin, and that's maybe perhaps the reason why wizards chose that animal as the Niffler disguise but because they're so highly trafficked, they are declining and they need our help. And the best thing you guys can do to help the Niffler from becoming extinct is just learning more about pangolins and to awaken a, a sense of wonder in you. And then you can learn about organizations that are working to protect them. And the more we learn about these animals, the more we are inspired to take care of them. And so this simple action of enjoying appreciating a little creature like the penguin and the niffler can make a profound impact for this animal that needs our help so desperately our next magical creature is the centaur now the centaur is the only creature who is granted being status because they are able to communicate with humans but they chose to remain classified as beasts now Regardless if they have a bee status or being status, they do demand our respect as they are very adept in many magic arts such as divination, astronomy, and in healing. Now, interestingly, the centaurs chose the last true wild horse species, an animal known as Zafalski's horse, as their non-magical disguise. Now, the pea horse, as muggles typically call them, used to roam the very vast Mongolian steppes of the Gobi Desert. They were found in, in the northern regions of 12 Asian countries. However, now the centaur is considered extinct in the wild, and they are regulated to only a few reintroduction sites. Now, Mogo zoos around the globe are working together to breed the Shavalski's horse and hoping to return this important iconic species back to Mongolia and the other regions. Having faced many problems in their past, such as uh, habitat degradation and, and hunting, the main threat of the Shavalski's horse is now climate change. So reducing our carbon footprint and conserving energy and resources are the best way to save the wild centaur. And now finally, number two is dragons uh, there are 10 species of dragons we don't have time to go over all 10 species so i'm picking the top three the top three favorite dragons of the wizarding world of harry potter at least picked by most fans and that is the ukrainian iron belly the hungarian horn tail and the norwegian ridgeback now, the Ukrainian iron belly is the largest dragon in the world, so of course, what other animal would they choose to be its disguise but the largest lizard in the world? The lizard found only at, on, in a few remote locations, specifically the island of Komodo. The Komodo dragons can get up to 200 pounds, being eight and a half feet long. They are a, uh, they definitely demand quite a bit of respect. But they're also a bit of a success story uh, in, in the ways of how we can change our mentality around animals, showing that they are worth more alive than dead. Now, many years ago, and to a degree, even still now, they were greatly feared and, and, uh, and persecuted for that fear, for their for, uh, ferocity. <clears throat> but nowadays, Thousands of people want to travel to Indonesia, want to travel to the island of Komodo and see these, these dragons in real life. And so ecotourism has brought them to, to a certain distinction that now natives want to protect them, want them around so that they can, because they are now an economic value. So again, proving that these animals are worth more alive than dead is probably one of the best ways that we 
as, uh, as muggles, we, as human beings, can help protect these species. The Hungarian Horntail is a fan favorite also. This is the, the dragon that Harry faced off in the Triwizard Tournament. It is the most dangerous dragon, the most aggressive dragon. Now, <laughs> the ironic part is that as aggressive as they are, their counterpart is adorable. <laughs> This is the horn lizard found in Texas and, and actually around the Southwest in general. And the horn lizard is also known as the horny toad. The Hungarian horntail ferocious beast, but was actually almost eliminated completely by habitat destruction in the United States Southwest. So muggle zoos have gathered horned lizards, horn tails, and and they've been breeding them, unbeknownst to them that they have under their wings a very deadly dragon. Now, numbers have been starting to rise since the reintroduction programs. So this is great for the, uh, the horned lizard, for the Hungarian horntail. Maybe not so much for witches and wizards who are deathly terrified of this animal. And the Norwegian Ridgeback is another fan favorite for people who remember in book one, Norbert, or no, Norberta, uh, as she became known as, the little baby dragon that Hagrid tried to raise. Most Norwegian Ridgebacks are in a Romanian reserve, but there are a few that are still found in the wild, and they are under a disguise of a really unique animal called the Gariel. Now this interesting looking reptile is a native to northern India and in the 1940s when Newt Scamander was checking these animals out, there were 10,000 gharial in the world. Now there are no more than 300 in the rivers of India. Now just like the hellbender, gharial do thrive in healthy rivers. So river pollution is a huge, huge threat. So is the uh, river degradation such as sand mining and hunting of the gharial species itself. So taking care of our rivers, whether we are in the United States or abroad, is important. Water health means not, not just healthy gharial, but a healthy ecosystem in general. And we all want to make sure that the gharial and the Norwegian Ridgeback are safe for the future Hagrids of the world. <laughs> All right, and my number one pick for today is the Crumplehorn Snorkak. The Crumplehorn Snorkak has been a favorite of mine since I read about it in the Harry Potter series, and mainly because it is a mythological creature within a realm of mythological creatures. However, I have a theory as to why we think the Crumplehorn Snorkak does not exist. I believe that this animal was so highly sought after that it almost became extinct until the wizards themselves felt it was necessary to hide it from the wizarding world, the wizarding community. I believe this happened so long ago, uh, as early as probably maybe in the 11th or 12th century, that magizoology didn't even exist, or at least it was in its infamy. So there wasn't any record of what animal they had disguised it as and it just faded into mythology. But, as I've been saying, these creatures do exist. And the creature disguising the Crumplehorn Sorkak is this beautiful animal known as the Scimitar Horned Oryx. They're found in the deserts of, of Africa, mainly around, around the, the country of Chad. Now, I think the idea that, that the Crumplehorn Sarkak definitely did not exist or proved as more evidence that they didn't exist was the scimitar horned oryx itself was hunted to extinction. The last oryx seen in the wild was in 1985. But 30 years after going extinct in the wild in 2016, we had a remarkable event. Since 1985, Muggle zoos have been breeding this animal just like they're trying to breed hellbenders, Shavalsky horses, and many, many others. They, uh, they've been breeding scimitar horned oryx, not knowing that it was a, a mythological magical creature in disguise. And in 2016, released the very first wild herd of captive bred oryx into a reserve in Chad. Now, again, this was an exciting excitement, not just for zoos, but for magizoologists, again, to, to see the return of the Crumplehorn Snorkak. 
I don't have any doubt that Luna Lovegood was definitely there to witness this event and to ensure that the Crumplorn Snark Axe are not hunted again. I do believe that she concocted that story that after years of searching that she's come to the conclusion that the Crumple Horn Snark Act does not exist. And you know what? Magic zoologists are practicing that, that speech themselves right there with Luna. Keep that secret. Pretend to the wizarding world that Crumple Horn Snark Acts do not exist. But now that we know, we can do our part to protect them for future generations. All right, guys. And there you have it. Fantastic beasts that are real. Let me know, what was your favorite? Do you love the Zou or the Hippogriff? How about the Thestral or the Demiguise? Maybe you are, uh, maybe I didn't mention your favorite animal. Let me know. You are welcome to contact me. My email is pjbevan at earthconservant.com and I will have this at the end of the presentation. Also, if I missed your favorite animal, once again, if I did, not it was not on purpose. As you can see just from this list alone, we had a ton of material to choose from. But I will be continuing on this series on my YouTube channel, and I hope to expand on this for, uh, for future presentations and for future, future events as well. We are not quite done here. We have one more aspect to, to consider, and that is how can we continue to save these fantastic beasts? So we have our, our fantastic beasts, and now we're going to go really more into depth of how we can save them. So we know that Newt Scamander, just, he dedicated his entire life to protecting and preserving magical creatures. But you know what? It's not just his job and it's not just my job. It's not just Madge's zoologist's job. It's all of our jobs. We can all do our part to help protect magical creatures. Now, climate change is a big issue for many uh, magical creatures and non-magical creatures. In fact, there is not a creature on earth, human or animal, magical or non-magical, that is not affected by climate change. And the simple actions can have a huge impact on the planet and on the animals that we love. Now we can do our part. Many buggles nowadays are carpooling, riding their bikes or walking to their destinations rather than driving. And if you're a witch or wizard wondering what you can do, understand that flu powder and port keys are a lot like cars. They do have a carbon footprint. So we can reduce our, our carbon footprint in the wizarding world with uh, by apparating or riding our broomsticks just like riding our riding our bikes or carpooling now if you do need to use a port key again uh, we can steal the term from muggles port key pulling and travel by port key with friends and family but other simple little actions can have a big impact as well just by turning off your lights whenever you leave a room saves energy and does it does a fair share of combating climate change and also we talked about going meatless uh, just one day a week. Going one day a week without meat has the effect of removing millions of cars off the road. In fact, if everyone in the United States just went one day every week without eating meat, it would be the equivalent of taking 17 million cars off the road every year. So don't doubt those small actions. Do your part, make a difference in not just animals' lives, not just the planet, but on your own health and well-being as well. And last but not least, I'm gonna say the best way to help save these animals is to share your love for all magical creatures, whether they're in this presentation, whether they're in your imagination, or whether they're right outside your back door. You can visit your local zoo, or your local nature center, and see these magical creatures in real life. Become a member, help support the zoo's mission, or to join an organization which focuses on your favorite fantastic bees. So as I mentioned, penguins have their own organization. Rhinos have theirs. Elephants have an organization. If you have a favorite animal, look it up to see what you can do to help protect them for you, future generations, but also for the planet as a whole. And then, of course, share your love. Spread the word. Share what you learned today with your friends and family. Talk about, be excited about your favorite animal. Talk about it. And then just 
simply appreciate this magical, wonderful world that we live in. The more we love it, the more we will protect it for ourselves, for our family, for the community, and for the planet. That Baba Diem, a great conservationist, once said, for in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. And there you have it. Thank you for coming on this fantastic quest to find our fantastic beast. I had a lot of fun with this. Uh, once again, it was surprising how difficult it was for me to choose just 12 or 13 animals to, to present to you. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please, by all means, let me know. Did I miss your favorite magical creature? You can email me. There's my email address on the screen, pjbevan at earthconservant.com. You can also connect with me online at zoofit.net. And thank you, Geek Girl Conline, again for having me. This has been a lot of fun. I hope to see you guys again really soon. Remember to always live green and geek out in a healthy and positive way.